Ladies and gentlemen, the next session will include remarks in Polish. If you require translation, headsets are available at each seat on the floor. Please tune to channel one. That's channel one, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. To introduce our next speakers, please welcome to the stage Director General of the Royal United Services Institute, Dr. Karen von Hippel. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session on defense and deterrence for a new era. I'm Karen von Hippel, the director of one of the crusty think tanks that Shawshank mentioned earlier, but it's really a privilege for all of us to be part of this consortium. And I'd also like to thank all of our partners and all of our incredibly hardworking colleagues who have been putting in a lot of time over the last few weeks. Um, today, it's really a pleasure to welcome two extremely distinguished speakers. Uh, they include His Excellency President Duda of Poland. Most of you know that Poland was the largest country of that early wave of new member states 20 years ago. And today, of course, Poland is really one of the most active members of the alliance. He will be joined by His Excellency Prime Minister Zayev of the Republic of North Macedonia. Uh, as we all know, North Macedonia is about to become the 30th member of NATO, its newest member. Uh, and I, I think it's fair to say that both countries are extremely committed to a strong alliance. They will be, the two speakers will be really discussing how NATO can meet the challenges of this new era of the 21st century. I think given all the uh, issues that were raised already in the morning session, there is a lot for them to talk about. And so uh, we're looking forward to hearing that. Now, I promised, uh, I'm, I'm about to introduce our moderator, Stephen Sacker, who, as all of you know, is the presenter for BBC's Hard Talk. And I really promised him a rousing applause from everyone here. So please join me in welcoming this panel. Thank you. Hall. Uh, it's also my honor and privilege to have two fantastic guest speakers with me today, two leaders who've taken time out from what is, I know, for both of them, a very busy schedule here in London with the NATO summit just ahead. Uh, but they've taken time out to be here to discuss with me some of the very, very important questions facing the NATO alliance right now. Just by way of introduction, I'm Stephen Sacker. As Karen said, I present the Hard Talk Show on BBC News. Uh, my day job is grilling and challenging people in power, holding them to account, and I'll be doing a little bit of that today. Uh, but both of my guests, I think it is fair to say, are viewing this NATO summit as something of very great significance. President Duda, of course, representing uh, Poland, one of the states which I would say right now is at the forefront of discussions of NATO's future. Poland very proud to meet the 2% of GDP spending commitment on defense. Uh, and we have uh, Prime Minister Zayev of North Macedonia, who of course is on the very cusp of joining the NATO alliance. I was just talking to the Prime Minister. He believes that the final phase of ratification will be done early in the new year, and then North Macedonia will be the 30th member of NATO. So, two wonderful guests to have with us. Uh, we have built this uh, as part of the NATO engages uh, event here. We build this as a discussion of defense and deterrence in a new era. And I think it is fair to say that NATO right now faces hugely important existential questions. So I'm going to ask both of you to open up with a, just some short opening remarks 
addressing the challenges that NATO faces today. I think challenges which get down to what is NATO for in this new era. So with that in mind, President Duda, would you kick us off? Uh, good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Uh, he told me that uh, I have two minutes to, to open this discussion, but this is very, very, very difficult to, to answer this question, a very complicated question in two minutes, because you have to look at the history of my country. This, the truth is we, we've been for more than 40 years behind the Iron Curtain. Yes, we, no, Poland was not was not fully independent, was, was not, was not uh, fully free country. And in 1989, we broke down the Iron Curtain. We, we won this very important battle and, and we, we, we became a member of, the, of a really free world, democratic Europe. And that was, I can say, our dream to join NATO, the strongest military, but defense alliance in the world we 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 dreamed about it to, to, to we we dream about uh, joining the european union and 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 we did it uh, first nato in 1999 yes and 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 after 5 years in 24 uh, we joined european union and 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 if you ask me about nato about our membership in, in nato about my my my, my vision of NATO, I, I, what, what I can say. First, we are very proud to be in NATO, yes, because uh, as I said, NATO is the, is the strongest military alliance in the world, and um, we can say that Europe, but especially this Euro-Atlantic area is one of the most peaceful and, and, and most, uh, and most uh, safe uh, areas in the world now because of, because of NATO uh, existation. And, 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 what can, and what can I say more? What is our goal looking at, at NATO? Yes, We would like to have NATO strong. We would like to have NATO uh, united. We, we would like to, 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 to preserve this cohesion of NATO and 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 uh, what was our uh, NATO's best achievement during last few years? I can say that was um, uh, the establishing of, of NATO presence on the, on the in the eastern flank. Yes, that was very important for our country. That was very important for Baltic states after the Russian invasion uh, first in Georgia, 2008, and and then uh, in in. In, in Ukraine in, in 2014, uh, this, um, this uh, enhanced forward presence in, in, the, in the eastern flank is one of, the, one, of the, one of the greatest achievements of NATO now. Great. Well, I, if I may then, I'm going to stop you there, President Duda, because what you've laid out there is uh, a vision based, as you put it, your words, on cohesion, on unity, and a real focus right now on NATO's eastern flank. So those are all key points that I want to keep in my head and we will come back to in the discussion. Now, Prime Minister Zayev, I want you, again, briefly if you can, just as we approach this NATO summit, to lay out for me as an incoming member what you see as the purpose of NATO right now, and particularly bearing in mind your own interests in the Balkans. So thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. It's, uh, for us, it's a specific pleasure because we are the next member country of NATO, 30th member country of NATO. It's good for NATO because 30th is better than 29. <laughs> but uh, of course, for the region, for the Western Balkans, Southeastern Europe, it's a precious one uh, achievement because mean more stability, security, safety, and immediately mean investment for any direct investment. Uh, everybody who is here must remember them that Balkan in the past was full of conflicts, wars, ethnical wars, a lot of damage, uh, damage for the region, but for the whole European continent. Now, NATO membership uh, after Montenegro, uh, we are next member of NATO. That mean really a lot of stability and security. Our citizens for this region, I can talk from the citizens from Republic of North Macedonia, so much belief 
in NATO, in unity, in stability, so we even changed our constitutional name. We became Republic of North Macedonia, of course, because of building good relations with our neighbors. We are a country without open bilateral issues with any countries in the neighborhood, but of course that opened the doors for our strategic goal. We fulfill our dream now, like Poland fulfilled 1999, uh, because uh, strategic goal for us means security, stability, no anymore uh, young people to be part of conflicts, to die, etc., but also to participate, to keep peace all around the world and share peace uh, all around the world. Uh, but also, as I mentioned, that bring a lot of economic aspects because also that strength, ruling of law, democratic values, uh, freedoms, etc., etc. Excellent. Well, Prime Minister, thank you very much. Thank you both. So you both, as I frankly expected, are leaders who come to NATO using the rhetoric of unity, of cohesion, of stability within the NATO alliance. But now that we get to the q and I'm going to introduce perhaps a, a little bit of sort of scepticism into the conversation. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I should say I'm going to sort of uh, quiz the two of them for 10 minutes or so. And then before we end the session, I absolutely want to see hands in the air and I want to get you guys involved as well. This is going to be question and answer. It's going to be uh, proactive uh, and interactive. So do frame your own questions as well. But let me start, President Duda, by suggesting to you that everything we've seen, whether it be from President Donald Trump and his deep skepticism about the pre preparedness of Europe to burden share in a realistic way, or whether it be from President Macron, who, as we know, in recent days has expressed his fear that, that NATO is brain dead in terms of having a meaningful conversation about its future strategy, there are deep divisions and disagreements within the NATO alliance. Would you accept that? You are talking about, about uh, the political discussions, yes, but uh, I also look at the, um, at the results, yes. What is the result? The result is, is, is NATO presence on the Eastern Flank. This is the result for me, yes. This is what I, what I expected. This is what, what we have now in Poland. But, but with respect, even in that, Mr. President, you have big problems. The Turkish government is now saying that it will block some of the new arrangements on the eastern flank, the defense of the Baltics and I guess Poland as well, unless you all, as a united alliance, sign on to the notion that the, the Kurdish groups in northern Syria are terrorists and formally acknowledge that fact. Yes, but NATO is an alliance of almost 30 uh, states, yes, 30 countries, and there are many interests, yes, and 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 of course this is the huge field of the discussion of the of the negotiation. I talked yesterday with uh, Mr. President Erdogan, and I hope that we will find a good solution. <laughs> but, but the, the point is. The outside world looking at NATO today hears your language about <coughs> unity and cohesion, but sees a reality, you call it politics, but sees a reality where increasingly the alliance isn't functioning as it should because of these internal divisions. In general, I don't agree. Because uh, look, at the, look at the perspective of last uh, 30 years, yes? In the 90s, we can say that NATO didn't exist. What, do you remember something about NATO in the 90s? Well, it was a different era in the 90s. Of course, yes. NATO was and still heavily yes, and time, defending Europe's borders. Time but changed, the yes. Was we, yes, but we had, we, had, we had new events. Yes, we had, as I said before, uh, we had uh, we had uh, Russian aggression uh, on, on on Georgia in Georgia yes in in 2008 we had we we have now Russian occupation of Crimea and part of of, of, of Ukraine and it started uh, in uh, in uh, 2014 so five years ago and 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 we still have a threat of the next invasion and what about NATO? And NATO, in my opinion, NATO has shown that uh, that is is alive. 
because that there was there was a, a, there was a, a, a very a very fast reaction of NATO for all this uh, for all, all this um, uh, changing of uh, of the situation. Just one more point, then I want to get Prime Minister Sayyid. But President Macron, and I'm sure you read his Economist interview just as I did, he, he is suggesting now that NATO has to move beyond regarding Russia as the prime threat. And your focus is on the eastern flank, but he's saying it's time for NATO to actually move beyond the eastern flank question and look at what is happening in the Sahel, for example. Look what's happening in terms of the global terror threat, in terms of cyber security, in terms of artificial intelligence. He actually wants a fundamental reset of the NATO strategic mind. You're suggesting NATO's strategic mind is, is stuck on Russia. Yes, but I don't, but, but I still don't see a problem. We can discuss about this. Because, you know, I, I, I believe in uh, 300, uh, 360 degree policy, yes? And, and, and for me, it's, it's crucial that we have to look around. This is not the only problem of the Eastern flank. We are a member of NATO, but we, do, we understand what it means that we are a member of NATO. This is not the, the pro, only the problem of our security, of, 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 of the defense of Polish and or, or Baltic states borders, yes? This is also the problem of, of, the, of the Southern Europe, yes? This is the, also the, the problem of the, um, of the of, of, um, of, of a terrorist uh, threat and, and other. So, so I understand it very well and I'm ready to discuss about it. So that's why we spent more than 2% of our GDP for def on, on defense because we are ready to fulfill um, or our duties uh, or our responsibilities as a NATO uh, member. Fascinating stuff. Thank you very much. Prime Minister Zayev, I want to come to you. Just some quick fire questions. Number one, we've just been talking about Poland's uh, uh, commitment to beating that 2% of GDP threshold on defense spending. You're the new member coming in in the new year. Can you guarantee to us all that you will be spending more than 2% of GDP on defense? I think that uh, in the last two and a half years, we have achievement what is very rare in the European continent. We even doubled our expenditures for, for defense. We was 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Now we are more than 1.4% of our GDP. Right, so you're and still of course, far short of what the Americans have demanded for a long time. Yes, but the goal is not later than 2024 to achieve 2%. I think that we will get it that earlier. And also we spend it more than 20%, in the moment 24% for modernization of our army, what is also one of the very important, very important thing. What is, as I mentioned, it very rare in the other member countries in European Union, Poland is a good example, but also we are the next member country and we started two and a half years and we do it 0.2% every year more. I, I I wouldn't say patience is Donald Trump's greatest virtue. And when he hears you saying, well, we'll get to 1.4% and then hopefully we'll move to 2% over a period of time, he may not regard that as hugely impressive. And when I, you said to me, you know, we've dreamed in Macedonia for a long time, North Macedonia, we've dreamed for a long time about joining NATO. I just wonder whether you worry that at the time you are now joining the alliance, the Americans are clearly having a conversation back home about whether they have a future in this alliance. You probably saw John Bolton, the former national security advisor to Donald Trump, said that he believed if Donald Trump wins a second term, the United States may go into full isolationist mode. Are you worried about the viability of the alliance, in particular America's role in the alliance? Uh, it's the president uh, uh, mentioned it. It's a political debate, really. I think that every member country will never forget the reasons of preparing uh, NATO, like uh, biggest, uh, biggest uh, alliance in the world, uh, keeping, uh, fighting for keeping peace and stability and security. And in that mind, of course, there will be in inside debate, of course, in the future. Uh, can be happen a lot of reforms uh, in NATO in alliance we must be more prepared for defense and deterring of course it's a 
third decade for 21st century will start next year, and the NATO must be prepared for the new challenges, but I don't believe that something uh, uh, big will happen with somebody who will go out from NATO. So the, the power of attraction of NATO, it's uh, really big, and I think that we'll continue in this direction, but of course there must be inside debate for final decisions having of, of that, uh, that matter. You know how you mentioned it, hard talks can be easiest one if we have really clear vision for our future, also in NATO, because we believe that we will be very soon full members of, of NATO. Well, I'm, I'm all for a bit of hard talk, that's <laughs> for sure. So, but I suspect some in our audience may be for a bit of hard talk too. So let me just quickly scan the room now, see if there are any hands going up who want to join the conversation at this moment. I've got lots more questions, but I do want to make this as interactive as possible. So if anybody at this point would like to ask a question of President Duda or Prime Minister Zayed, uh, you, sir, have a hand up, so we'll get to you. There's a microphone there. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Filip Darabenda. I'm a student from the University of Kent. Uh, this is a question to North Macedonia. Do you believe that Poland has become a global, I mean, a regional superpower with the Free Seas Initiative and its close link with the United States? Do you see working closer with Poland and its initiatives? I mean, as you, as you spoke about um, Donald Trump cutting his kind of, uh, you know, ties with Europe, uh, do you believe that Poland could be a bridge between the US and Europe in that sense? Okay. Yes, of course. Well, you're the the, sitting here, so I didn't think you were No, no, no. <laughs> oh. So Poland, Poland is one of the countries who was in the, in the, in the, in the past one of the biggest supporter for our country to achieve not only solutions of all these bilateral issues, but standards, what is needed to fulfill to be full members of NATO and also a member of European Union. Uh, of course, that kind of politics from all Visegrad's group before, and especially Poland, was a good example for us. How they manage with the situation, how to help each other. So they share the whole experience with us in six Western Balkan countries to achieve as soon as possible all needed criteria. So we fulfill all criteria, uh, having in mind that we are a democratic country, that ruling of law is very important, like uh, the criteria in NATO, uh, complete freedoms, of course, and uh, that, is, that is very helpful if for I us. May, Prime Minister, and I want the President's view on this as well, I want to pick up on that question by just reflecting again on politics. Now, you two say, ah, oh, Stephen, you know, politics is politics, but the alliance goes on. But the fact is, just last month, you received a major kick in the teeth from France <laughs> because <laughs> President Macron basically blocked your accession talks going ahead for North Macedonia and for Albania, and he said, you know what, I'm not happy anymore with the entire accession process. We've got to restructure it, reframe it, and we're going to call a halt to further accessions. It seems to me that creates another big political tension inside NATO, because here's Macron saying, I want more focus on the EU as a strategic defense alliance platform, and at the same time, he's blocking you from EU membership, which creates tensions inside NATO. How worried are you about these new tensions within Europe? What's really unfair for us, like candidate countries, we are candidate country 15 years, and we have 10 positive recommendations, and now they confirm all 28 uh, countries there uh, in the European Union Council. They confirm that we fulfill 100% of the reforms upon that. We find solution with Bulgaria. Upon that, we find solution with this, through this historical agreement with Greece. Through this agreement, we even change our constitutional name normally. And he decided, also he mentioned it, that now Europe needs more time because of future reforms. Of course, uh, was very disturbing for us, and uh, we was very mu much dis disappointed. But we're continuing with these reforms, what we do, do and we hope that this mistake, because it was a mistake for Europe, not only for us, uh, will be uh, changed very soon. All countries, only France, was the, the only one who expect uh, the debate for the new methodology for enlargement of European Union, and we uh, hope that we will continue very soon our path to full membership of European Union. To, to be blunt about it, President Duda, do you see the things that President Macron is doing right now in a European context and in a NATO context as being deeply problematic. Would you use the same language of mistakes being made? Hmm. 
I'm sure that uh, Euro-Atlantic Alliance is one of the crucial elements of our stability. Uh, I'm talking about Europe, not only about Poland, about our, our stability and, 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 uh, and, uh, and our security, yes. And uh, the question is what, what shall we do to, to preserve and to, to, to protect um, all, um, all this achievement we have now? Because I can say that look at the European Union and look at the NATO. Of course, we know there are many problems in both alliances. Yes, there is. There are tensions, and we have Brexit uh, in European Union. Okay, I know, but do you, can you? But 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 can you can you show me the 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 the, the, the greatest successes in in uh, in the entire world than those two? Unions, yes, two alliances, NATO alliance and European Union alliance. No, this is this is uh, two best um, institutions created in the world during the last 100 years. Yes, and of course we have tensions because we have many countries. As I said, many countries with uh, their own interests. Yes, and and uh, and we have to discuss how to improve. Uh, the, the problems, how to improve mechanisms, and uh, if you if you hear the voice of Mr. President Macron, yes, um, I would like to ask him, Mr. President, don't talk about the brain of the of the NATO and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's please propose us what can we do to um, to to improve um, our cooperation in NATO in your opinion? Okay. Yes. Yes. But concrete, Actually, please, please give us concrete proposition. Yes. What What shall we do? Okay. This is the This is the first I, I, element. But the Mr. President, <laughs> we're running short of time, and I want to ask some very quick fire questions. But I also want to get at least one more audience question in, and we're short of time. Sorry, Mr. President, but uh, we'll come back to to you. I promise you. Hello. Yes, um, sir. Paul Taylor from Friends of Europe. Uh, to both presidents, y you've talked really only about the Eastern Front and the Balkans. Um, but many people inside NATO also see security challenges in the South. Uh, and really, there's been no thought, apparently, given at all to that at the moment. So what, do you, what more do you think NATO should be doing in the South? Who should be taking care of security in the Sahel, uh, stabilizing Libya, uh, uh, um, looking at uh, possibly uh, peacekeeping in the, uh, in the Near East and so on? Are those roles for NATO, or if not, for whom? Okay, Thank you. Good, good question. But I both of you, can I ask now for really brief answers to the point, because we want to squeeze in as much as possible. So, President Duda first on that one. I have no doubts that we have to look at the NATO as the alliance of all uh, member, member states, yes? So this uh, approach, NATO uh, 360 degrees, is, is the crucial idea uh, in NATO. And, and, and we should look at the eastern flank of NATO, and we also should look at the, at the southern flank of the, of the NATO, and, and we have to achieve all, all, um, all uh, and we have to, 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 to to try to answer for all uh, the challenges we have there. So this is, I, I have no doubts. All right, and Prime Minister Zayed. I think uh, if we mention that, is, that, that NATO is the biggest alliance in the world and the more important war and peace uh, factor in the world, also have a responsibility to keep peace all around the world. And of course, some uh, aspects of more focus in the, in the South because there is really need as soon as possible peace. Everybody who can help can address there and to be more focused. Also, NATO have it, bigger responsibility right, for that. So you're both talking about you know, the 360 degree approach, but let me ask you a very simple question. You can almost answer it yes or no. Is Vladimir Putin's Russia still the number one threat to NATO? I think the, the, the NATO have the threats in front of, 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 of alliance uh, connected with the modern world, with 21st century. Uh, cyber threats, uh, security threats, uh, that, that kind of hybrid threats 
what has happened very much, and we must be very much focused all together to share experience, yeah. how to find of that, to, to deter that, and of course uh, to defend from that. That is the, the modern threats. Sometimes can, can happen also from inside of NATO countries. It depends on what kind of radical structures are playing or not. Russia still the number one threat? I don't want to assess which threat is, 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 is higher, which threat is more dangerous. Yes, we have terrorist threat now, we have um, uh, threat of uh, Russian imperialism, uh, we have uh, threats on, on the uh, uh, Middle East, yes, we have many threats around and we have answered. Uh, I sadly have a threat of my own to deal with now because I've got a red badge up there saying time's up, which is most unfortunate because I know there are lots more questions uh, in the hall and I know hands are still going up, but I have been told on the strict pain of punishment that if I overrun too much, I'll, I'll, I'll be carted off and sent to the Tower of London or something. So, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm sorry that I haven't managed to squeeze more questions in. I think you'll all agree that the input from both of our leaders here has been fascinating, nuanced but fascinating. So I thank you, President Duda and Prime Minister Zayef, very much indeed, and I thank you all for listening so patiently. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief International Correspondent at the BBC, Ms. Lise Doucette.